This morning we have a slightly different preach. Uh, Mike has asked five people to be involved in speaking this morning, and uh, shortly we'll get the first one up, but uh, just let me set the scene for you. So uh, we have as a church um, 11 values. Uh, If you go to our website, you can find them. And these are values, they're not intended to be just uh, corporation values, you know, values of a corporate organization. Uh, But actually, as we look through the scriptures, and as we read particularly the New Testament, uh, they are kingdom values that we see worked out in the New Testament. So um, it's important for each of us, as we think about our vision to be shaped by God to shape the city, it's important that we let these values take hold in our hearts and shape us, and uh, individually, but corporately together as well. So Mike has asked, as I say, five people to come forward uh, and to share on five of these 11 values that we have. Um, He's asked some people that uh, we don't normally have uh, standing up on a, at the front on a Sunday morning, which is wonderful. And part of the reason for that is because uh, it's, a, it's really demonstrating the way that these values have really laid hold of individuals' hearts. Uh, so he's asked people to come and um, uh, share what is the value and then to speak briefly about how that value has had an impact in their own lives. So I'm just going to pray, and, uh, and then I think we have Ryan up first, and then I'm trusting that you all know what order you come in after that. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you for your kingdom purposes, Lord, and uh, Father, we thank you for each one of these people who uh, will be coming to speak to us this morning, Lord. We pray that you would... Um, We thank you for what you've laid on their hearts, Lord God, and we pray that you would give them a peace in their hearts and the ability to speak from the heart what you've laid on them. And uh, Lord, we ask you that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning, and Lord, we ask you to shape us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ryan. Thank you. Oh, wow, this clock's here. Hello. Oh, yeah, my name's Ryan. Um, if I haven't met you, I do 180 Youth, so shout out to the youth. Uh, we just got back from Soul Survivor, so I think they're all asleep probably, but um, Albert decided that pranking at 4.30 a.m. was the perfect time to just uh, prank, so that's why they're all so tired. But um, I want to ask before we start, has anyone seen the movie The Titanic? Really? Only that many people? Like, literally, how many people have seen it? It's like one of the biggest selling movies. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I was like, oh, okay. Um, this is really going to fall short. But so the movie Titanic is a big movie. James Cameron, obviously, Leo with his boyish good looks. And I want to say Kate Winslet? Yeah, Kate Winslet being the female character. And um, the movie Titanic, it's a great movie, right? It's, it's got romance. It's got love. It's got boats and water and uh, other such things that people like in movies. And one of the big things about the Titanic is that there's the kind of the classes. So there's the, the upper class in 1910, and they're all there with their nice hats or whatever and chandeliers, and they're all drinking tea on this boat, and that's kind of their experience of this maiden voyage of the biggest ship ever and whatever. They, I don't know, they have nice servants who bring them cakes and tea and other things that people liked back then. And then there's the kind of lower class and the kind of the grunts, the workers and the poor people, and Leo's one of the poor people, and, you know, it's just a... Great storyline. Anyway, um, the thing, one of the most powerful things about the movie The Titanic is that we know that the boat goes down. We know as an audience, it's in the trailer, they don't try and hide it, everyone knows it's a historical fact. We know the whole time the boat is going to sink. So we're watching these people live out their lives and do these things and have nice tea, and we kind of know in the back of our mind, oh no, it's, it's a tragedy, you know, it's going to be sad and there's love and there's people getting to know each other and, and we just know that that love's not going to work out and they're probably going to die and it's all very sad and the, the ship sinks at the end. Sorry for the spoilers, but it is in the trailer. And I think that the same thing as Christians. We know that this world is temporary. We know that this ship is sinking. That one day God's going to come back and he's going to judge the living and the dead and it's all going to start again. And I think often as Christians, we get caught up in the same sort of thing as the upper class deck and we like our nice food and our nice houses and our good jobs and our cool clothes and all these things. And we sort of forget that actually as people, as Christians, the whole point of following Christ is to save us from our sins. So that at the end, when that ship sinks, we know where we're going. We know that we're safe. And I'm very motivated for mission. And my topic is mission in case you haven't guessed it or... Oh, it is behind me. 
And, and Grace City believes in this mission. We don't believe in just sitting on that deck and pretending like the Titanic's fine and everything's going to be great and hopefully I get the best, I don't know, drinks package or whatever. Probably didn't have those on the Titanic, but, you know, modern day cruises analogy. Um, but this is what we want to be motivated as, as Grace City, and I'm very motivated by The people that I meet, I know that this is temporary, that this isn't all there, there is. This doesn't go on forever. Um, in 2010, I did what is probably every mother's worst nightmare, and I got a tattoo in Thailand. And um, I'm fine, I think. It's been a few years, so I think I'm clean. Um, but I had a good reason, though, because I got 50,000 points at the scav hunt. So it was worth it, I think. But my team did lose still. But um, anyway, so I got this tattoo, right? And I got a cross on my shoulder. I'll show you for a sec. It's terrible, just by the way. Oh. All right, it's like blue and it's kind of faded and it's terrible. And Anyway, I got this cross and I was with all my mates and a lot of them are non-Christian. And I was like, yeah, cool. I'm going to get 50,000 points. Let's get this tattoo. I'll get a cross on my shoulder. I'll never regret that. And I was sitting there and, and, my, and my best mate, Joey, was there with me. He's not a Christian. He was like, oh, Ryan, it's cool. You get a tattoo. Like, you okay about it? And, and I started getting a bit emotional. I was like, actually, this kind of like means a lot to me. And he sort of looked at me getting emotional. He was like, oh, dude, are you like thinking you were going to regret it? Like, I'm like halfway through. I'm like... He's like, you won't regret it, man. Like, you're Christian. I'm sure you'll, you'll love it for the rest of your life. And I'm like, no, no, it's not that. It's like I'm reflecting on how much this symbol means to me. I'm like, I'm getting a cross. That's, that's Jesus' cross. That's what saves me from my sins. That's what takes me to heaven. That's the greatest loving act ever known when God died for man. And I'm sitting there talking to Joey about it, and I'm getting emotional. I'm like, dude, like, to be honest, the reason I'm getting upset, and he kind of told him we're talking after this, I was like, I really don't want you to go to hell. And it's kind of the most candid I've ever been with him. I was like, you know, like, I believe this, this cross applies to me, but I know that it doesn't apply to you, and I really don't want you to go to hell. And, and he's my best friend, and he was, you know, very nice, and he was sort of like, oh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be okay. And I was crying, and he's like, you know, I'm sure God will find me or whatever. Like, I don't know, he didn't know what to say. But I was just like, and it really stood out to me that moment, that that is, that is my core motivation, I'm really sad and scared that my friends are going to hell. And I want to be on mission with them. So I just want to talk very briefly about how kind of mission plays out in my life. I don't run around screaming, the ship's going to sink. I think that's like the Titanic if someone's just like, guys, I swear the ship's sinking. It's like, we're enjoying our tea. It's like, it's just not going to be effective. They're not going to run and just wait in line at the lifeboats or whatever. Um, so I try and live by two principles generally. The first one is that I want everyone I meet to know that I'm a serious Christian. This is just kind of how I play out mission in my life. I just want people to know when I meet them, I make friends with them. I don't kind of hide it. I sort of say it pretty candidly and I sort of let them know that I'm like a real Christian. You know, like I'm not just sort of you know, Sundays or whatever or my parents are Christian. I'm like, I'm a real Christian. I like it. I do stuff. I'm, I'm into it. I'm real, you know. And then the second principle I try to do is that I want to give people plenty of opportunities to talk about it. I try and raise it in conversation or I try and talk about something in church. And if people are talking about, I don't know, politics or whatever, I'll kind of talk about, so I'll say, oh, yeah, as a Christian, I think this or whatever, or talk about current affairs and that kind of thing. Or I've tried a little bit with social media, but it's kind of terrible. And, but I think there's, there is some people who do it well, and I'd like to be in that discussion. But I want to be able to talk about it. Because I want, if they have that moment, if a lot of my friends, if Joey or any of my other friends have that moment where they think, you know, what do I do? What do I think about this? I want, I, want, I want to be someone that they come and ask. I want them to know that I'm open and I'm loving and I'm willing to talk about it and I'm serious about it and it matters to me and I'll show them grace and love and we'll talk about it and have a great conversation. I always want to be in that place with them. That's just how mission plays out in my life. I want to share one last story um, of a friend of mine called Lara. And I used to work at the cafe with her, and she just finished high school, so she's working in hospitality while she saved up for a gap year. And she was kind of unsure, and we had a lot of great conversations. I was really candid about being a Christian. She was pretty open to talking about it. We would have good conversations. Eventually, I was like, oh, you want to read a book or whatever? She was like, oh, not really, but you can give it to me, and I might read it. And I was like, all right. So I gave her a book called The Reason for God by Tim Keller. Anyway, I didn't see her for a couple of years, and... Um, Someone told me that she was started going to church. She was totally non-Christian. And I was like, oh, what? Lara's going to church? Like, we had so many good chats and everything. And she didn't tell me, which I was a bit upset about. But I started messaging her on Facebook and being like, hey, what are you up to these days? <laughs> Busy on Sundays? Um, 
And, 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 and eventually she responded to me and I was like, and it just blew my mind. It gave me just that renewed confidence and faith that God does save people. Um, and that, and that we, we are on to something here as Christians. We can have confidence. Um, she, so I said, oh, what's going on? You're Christian now, blah, blah, blah. And she said, um, oh, I was actually meaning to tell you. So I pretty much started talking to a friend at uni about his faith and was really blown away by how much sense it made to me. Then I asked my friends about a million questions and did so much research, read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, um, and investigated into the Gospels and couldn't really deny God's existence and Jesus' sacrifice for us. So yeah, that's it in short. Now just so, so stoked to have Jesus in my life and to follow him. I was like, that's like real. That's like, you're stoked to have Jesus in your life. You're not like, oh, I'm just attending church or whatever. It's like, you're stoked to have Jesus in your life. And it just made me so happy. And like, I was a bit upset that I wasn't there for kind of the final conversion moment, but I was happy to know that I was part of the picture. I was a piece of the puzzle. And I was glad that I spoke to her then in that, in that cafe. And I hope that that guy who met her at uni, you know, gives me some credit or whatever. But <laughs> like, I'm stoked about him. I'm stoked that he's there. There's a guy out there in some uni talking to this chick about Jesus. There's people doing things. We are on mission as a church. You're a piece of a puzzle in, pe- in people's life. You're one of the aspects, you're one stage in their relationship to following God. So just implore you and encourage you as a church, just keep going with those people. You don't know where you are along the journey, but um, yeah, just be open to that kind of thing. All right, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us, Lord. He commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations, Lord. Grace City is a great testament to that with regions beyond and all the different nationalities we have here, Lord. We want to keep going. We want to keep making disciples, Father. We know that this, this world is temporary. This place, this isn't the final place. We want to help point people to Jesus, Lord. Please give us some surprising evangelistic opportunities this week. Stuff that we know isn't normal. Might we be great um, influences in people's lives? They would come to us and ask questions and we'd just be a source of hope and potentially inspiration or anything like that, Lord. Please just give us divine opportunities. Help us to always be on mission for you, Lord. Help us to pass on the grace that we've received, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. My subject is the grace. <clears throat> and when I was first asked, is this loud enough? When I was first asked, the first thing that came to my mind was something I learned many years ago. G R A C E stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. And I loved that because it just narrowed things down. Mine is in the, in the form of a little mini um, testimony. And I realised, of course, that we cannot ever achieve. Uh, salvation by our own works. And there's two lovely little verses that I want to give you today, uh, and they're wonderful ones to learn and memorise yourself. The first one comes from Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, and it's chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. And this other verse, beautiful, comes from his letter to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 21. It said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Beautiful verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So it's only through Christ that we are made righteous. We, most of us know that. But uh, I just wanted to look, I, in fact I looked back and I thought it's actually 60 years ago this year that I received that gift into my life at a Billy Graham crusade. I was 14, so I'm 74 in case you think I'm about (laughs) (laughs) it. And it was wonderful because 
the church that we belonged to had forbidden us to go and hear him. And my dad, who was certainly not the spiritual giant in our family, said, we're going. <laughs> so my two sisters, mum and dad and I, five of us went off to hear Billy Graham. And uh, being 14, I knew exactly what he was talking about when he spoke about sin and how we'd all fallen short of God's standards. And so the whole five of us went forward to receive Christ into our hearts at that meeting. And we came back to a church that had forbidden us, so there wasn't much growth for, for a fair while. And a lot of other things were happening in our lives at that time. So it was seven years later that I remember going off to a Katoomba Christian convention. By this time I was working in the city, found a lovely lunch hour service and some lovely new Christian friends, and they told me about Katoomba Christian conventions. So off I went, and oh, the messages were just so anointed and wonderful that I bought up many, many tapes, cassettes, that's how far back it was, <laughs> and came back and began to share them with the family. <clears throat> and then um, I, I just went to every convention that was available at the time. And uh, God's spirit was really beginning to work in my life because I was hearing the anointed word of God and it was motivating me and causing me to want to grow and know much, much more. And there came a meeting where the speaker, and I can't remember who it was, but uh, invited people to come forward if they were willing to be channels through which God could move. And as shy as I was and as nervous as I was, I was the first one down the aisle of that auditorium to a tune, which is very old now, but it was um, channels only, blessed master. But with all your risen power flowing through me, you can use me every day and every hour. And that applies still to us all, doesn't it? So yes, I had a hungering for God's word and I have all my life since loved God's word. There was many prunings, chastenings, and God was making way for much more of this beautiful grace, this free gift. So it was God's grace that Jesus brought into my life. He rescued me and then he restored me, gave me his new name and still is restoring me. And that was in order to bring me into a relationship and I hadn't realised we could have a personal relationship with Father God and with Jesus. And um, <clears throat> I have to share also that he is still teaching me new things. And I wanted to share that a couple of the new things that he's been teaching me this year. And uh, it's that I now have God's DNA running through me. Isn't that wonderful? His DNA, the spiritual DNA. So there's no excuse not to get up and do what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> and that we often ask for many things of God that we already have. So I've had to... Check a few things there as well. God has such riches for us, such riches. And the thing he loves is, I think you mentioned it today here, that you're thanking him, or someone did anyway, just thanking him daily. He just loves that as well, just for us to show our gratitude. Even though we might be feeling a little down or whatever, look for ways to thank him and you'll be blessed and you'll be lifted out of depression or whatever else there is. This morning I read this beautiful verse in my little daily devotional. <clears throat> the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I have found too another wonderful thing that's happened in my heart is I love to sing to him as well. And uh, someone, I think one of the songs earlier alluded to the veil and I'll never forget way, way back in my searching God's word, finding this for, my, for myself. It wasn't any preacher or anything that showed me this, but I was preparing a Sunday school lesson or something. And I saw that the, that veil in the temple, when Christ died, many miraculous things happened. And that veil in the temple was ripped in two and it was very, very thick. I think about three, three or four inches or I don't know how many centimetres that is. But it was torn from the top to the bottom and we were saying, come into the Holy of Holies. 
Come into the Holy of Holies. And there's a beautiful song, and this is what I often sing to the Lord. Come into the Holy of Holies. Enter by the blood of the Lamb. I've just forgotten that mix a little bit, but there's, an, and there's also another one too. No, sorry. That's a beautiful song, but it's this one. Within the veil I now would come into that holy place to gaze upon your face. I see such beauty there. No other can compare. I worship you, my Lord, within the veil. It's open. Folks, he has wonderful things in store for all of us. Bless you. May I pray for you. Father God, we thank you that you have provided a way for all of us to come to know you, to love you. Thank you for your mighty plan which sent Jesus to the earth to show us what you're like. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing. You saw our dilemma. And we thank you that you came to provide a way back to heaven for all of us. And I pray for these precious brothers and sisters that you will move them in and to all the new things that you want to do. We thank you for our salvation. I'm sure many of them already know you as Lord. And for any who don't, Lord, that you will tug at their hearts until they yield their lives to you. I bless each and every one of them, Lord, like Paul used to say, a a great blessing on his um, readers. I bless these precious brothers and sisters and I pray that they will just grow into Christ in newer and newer ways and know more and more freedom, victory and joy. Thank you for your priceless gift that we can come inside that veil and have a new intimacy with you. In Jesus' name I thank you. Amen. Okay, so I'm Davin, and I wanted to kick off with a question. What do you think it means to know God? What do you think it means to know God? I'm sure we'd all have a slightly different answer to this question, but I think we can agree it's a pretty important question to ask. I know it's one that I asked myself early on in my walk with God, um, you know, when I was trying to figure out who is God, who am I, what is my, my purpose for my life? And I'll never forget, I came across a passage of scripture in Matthew 7, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, where Jesus is um, talking about a a group of people that approach him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out many demons? Did we not perform many incredible, wondrous acts? And it says that Jesus looked at them and said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. I never knew you. And if I'm honest, that freaked me out because, you know, I hadn't done half of the things on that list. Uh, How did I know that I wasn't one of those people that stands before him and says, Lord, and he says, sorry, I never knew you. So my prayer became, God, whatever you do, show me what it is to know you. Shortly after that, I was was volunteering at uh, an orphanage in South Africa called Footprints. Yolanda hates me calling it an orphanage. She prefers a home full of children. Essentially, this mom and her two daughters uh, have adopted and now raise, house, feed, and educate 32 abandoned children with no government support, no church funding, no corporate funding, completely by faith. And um, I, every time I went back home to South Africa, I would go there and, and volunteer and help out. And as I was with the kids, I just felt God saying to me, Devin, take care of these children. This is what it is to know me. And I said, okay, and we've been partnering with them and supporting them ever since. A couple of years later, my spiritual mentor asked me this question. He said, Devin, what do you think it means to know God? I gave my, my standard answer. You know, I think it's spending time in prayer, reading the word, being obedient to his commands. And he said, well, what does scripture say? I said, I don't know. I've never you know, really seen an explicit place where God defines what it is to know. And he guided me to a passage of scripture in Jeremiah 22, verse 15 and 16. Jeremiah is talking to Shalom, king of Judah. And it says, Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? Yet he did what was right and just. And so all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. 
And it was like a light bulb went on. For the first time, as clear as day, God defining right there what it is to know him. And as I started to look at scripture through this lens, it became obvious. I started to see it everywhere. I don't have time to go into to all the scriptures, but the one that made it absolutely blindingly obvious was Matthew 25, another scripture I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, probably the most underpreached passage of scripture in the church today, where Jesus says, when I come back to judge the earth, this is how I'm going to do it. Okay, now as a side note, did any of you at school have one of those teachers where, you know, at the end of the curriculum, they'd go through all the work you've been studying, and they'd be like, okay, for the big exam, study this, don't do that, don't worry too much about this, focus on this. If you study nothing else, Davin, make sure you study this, which is all I studied, and I passed, okay? That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, guys, if you forget everything else I've said, please don't forget this. This is what the big test is on. This is what the exam's on. This is I'm going to judge the earth, right? We know what he says. I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the sheep were Pentecostals, and the goats were Catholics. <laughs> no. The sheep figured out correctly who was going to heaven and who was going to hell, and the goats didn't manage to figure out who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. The sheep prayed the sinner's prayer, made up in 1850. The goats didn't pray the sinner's prayer. No, 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 no. The sheep were the sheep because when I was hungry, they fed me. When I was thirsty, they gave me something to drink. When I was naked, they clothed me. When I was sick, they took care of me. When I was in prison, they visited me. And the righteous, the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you and do these things? And it'll say, truly, I tell you that when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all went well with him. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. You know what the best part about this truth in the scripture is? Is that not only is it how God defines knowing him, it's also the best way to live. You see, as taking care of the poor went from being a bullet point on a doctrinal belief statement of mine to becoming the very center of how I live my life and how I commune and walk with God, I started finding myself experiencing more joy, more hope, more love, more peace, more purpose, more power than I could ever hope, dream, or imagine. You see, as for a job, what I get to do now, I get to work for a Christian non-for-profit called WorldShare, where we are partnering with six faith-based NGOs in four developing nations where we are working in these communities to take the gospel of Jesus Christ out to them, whilst at the same time meeting the needs of the poor through health and educational means. My job is to connect with every single day Christians, much like yourself, who fund and support this work that we do. I get to do life and fellowship with them and fill them in on the great work that we're doing and how the, how the gospel and the kingdom is being advanced. For the rest of the time, I work in the fashion space, I know, a bit of a contrast, but specifically working for an ethical uh, fashion tech startup called Threat Harvest. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the fashion industry is one of the second biggest contributors to pollution in the world next to oil, one of the second, or well, the second biggest contributor to modern day slavery next to the electronics business. God's called us to go into that industry and bring light and transformation to it. I love, love what I get to do. Now, am I telling you to resign from your job and go work for a charity or a social enterprise? No. No, no, you are where God has called you to be. What I am saying is as you start to think on this truth, as you begin to meditate on this truth, the significance of the fact of how God feels about the poor and the needy, as that becomes central to how you live and your walk with him, what you'll find is yourself walking in opportunities, doors will begin to open. You'll find yourself doing things that you only ever dreamed of, experiencing God in ways that you only ever dreamed of. I bless you with an awareness that you have been called by God to partner with the risen Christ in advancing his kingdom on the earth. That he has gifted you with skills, with abilities, with wisdoms, with talents to go out and establish heaven every place that you see hell. I bless you with the knowledge that you serve a God who believes in you more than you believe in him and that he defended the cause of the poor and the needy. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? The question I want to leave you with is, do you know him? So Father, as we just stop and pause now, Lord, as we just reflect on your truth, how it challenges us, 
how it changes and transforms us. We just thank you for this time, Lord God. Father, I thank you that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by our works, but for our works, Lord God, that the world would see your church in action, living the way you've called us to live. Father, I pray that you would just be be speaking to every single person here right now. Would you give us the courage to see things differently and the irresistible urge to act on those things that we see, Lord God? Father, I thank you that you're speaking to each and every one now in this congregation. That as I'm speaking right now, you're putting on each of their hearts a person, an organization, or something where they can partner with you through using their treasure, their time, and their talents to take care of the least of these. Father, I also just feel in my heart that I want to raise South Africa to you right now, Lord God. I know there's so many of my fellow countrymen come to this church, Lord God, and it's going through some testing times now with elections. I pray that you would just be with its leaders. Continue to anoint the ones that you've called to come into power, and would you bring transformation in that country? It so desperately needs you. And God, would you put on our hearts how we can best partner with you in bringing your kingdom into that country as well and in regions beyond. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Wow, that was amazing, hey? We don't need notes. I'm not one of them, unfortunately. Um, My name's Gillian, if you don't know me, and um, Mike's asked me to speak today about the value of being faithful to Scripture. I'm actually just going to read the definition to you that um, that Mike gave me. In the world today, there are many different and conflicting opinions about God, life, the afterlife, and everything in between. With these different opinions, we're living in a day and age which is more uncertain than ever about how to find the truth. We believe that in Scripture, we have something incredible, not simply another opinion, but the very words of God. We have the true perspective on life, humanity, salvation, heaven, hell, and all the big questions of life. We believe that in the scriptures we find a worldview that is deeply coherent and brings life to those who believe in the God of its pages. Therefore, we take the Bible as our first and final authority when it comes to matters of doctrine, lifestyle, and the formation and flourishing of our churches. Being part of a church that is faithful to the authority of scripture is really important to me and also being part of a church that values word and spirit is essential and I know Scott's going to be super passionate about being empowered by the spirit when he comes next. But I want to see the word of God move in power and sometimes we sing that. I want to see the word of God transform my life, your life and the lives of people I love who don't yet know Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, me and you, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now I'm not going to tackle any big doctrinal issues in this moment this morning, but I'm just going to share personally from a very familiar and famous psalm about what it's meant to me and how I apply the authority of scripture just personally in my life. So I'm just going to look at Psalm 121, which I'm sure many of you know really well. And it starts with, I lift my eyes up to the mountains, where does my help come from? Now mountains are majestic, awe-inspiring, beautiful. We attempt to climb them, cross them, we race down them to feel the thrill of being alive. But they can also be obstacles, barriers in our life to where we want to get to, literally and figuratively. And does any one of us not need help to navigate the challenges of our earthly existence? The psalmist goes on to say, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Colossians 1.16 says this about Jesus, for in him all things were created, 
things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He made everything. The scripture tells me he made everything. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. So he is well qualified to be my help. <clears throat> scripture persuades me, convinces me. People may fail me, but he never will. The psalmist goes on to say, He will not let my foot slip. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He won't let me fall. He is able to keep me. Jude one twenty four says to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. That God is watching over me, looking at me. He's never tired, he's never asleep when I'm floundering or when I call out to him. The psalmist goes on. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Both day and night he is there for me, watching me. I'm known by him. I'm seen by him. When I'm among throngs of people, when I'm all alone, in the middle of the night, when I'm fearful and I can't sleep. <clears throat> Again, the psalmist says, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. He sees the big picture of my life, the past, the present and the future, and watches over me, knows me like no other, loves me like no other. And finally, the Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. From eternity past to eternity future, the Lord watches over my coming and going, which at times are peaceful, but often are fretful and anxious. When I look back over my life, I can see him working in both good times and bad times. I can see how he's held me in his hands. So I can trust him for the future though it be uncertain. I can trust for future provision, for my marriage, for my children's future, for all the changing seasons of my life, because scripture assures me it is so. The psalmist tells me truth, reminds me of how great his love for me. This scripture of Psalm 121 with great authority reminds me that God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Therefore, he's able to keep my foot from slipping. He keeps gravity working. He can hold me up. I can trust him. He never falters or tires. He's so far above me, he doesn't need to sleep like I do every day just to function. He watches over me. He knows the depths of my heart and still he loves me. Not even my closest friend can do that. He watches over me day and night. He saves me and he keeps me. He's always with me. Even in situations where others can't go with me, I'm never alone. This, this affects me deeply, this truth. There is one who is able to completely hold me, keep me, watch over me, who never tires or shuts his eyes for a moment. When I apply this truth and believe it in my heart, I can let go of anxiety and fear about my future, my family. I can stop frantically trying to protect myself knowing that the one who never slumbers or sleeps will keep me. Let's encourage each other with this scripture and be faithful to it. As Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Let's share scriptures with one another <clears throat> as we meet together to worship. Let's sing scripture to each other. So many of our worship songs are scripture. Let's read scriptures aloud to, during worship to strengthen ourselves. Let's study in small groups together. Let's also privately search the word for truth and declare it, preaching the truth to our own souls. Maybe go home and search for the scriptures that your favorite worship song is based on. 
I can recall many times when friends here in this room have encouraged me with a Bible verse as we've studied the word together or as we've worshipped or as we've prayed together. Let's me and you find more ways to do that. <clears throat> Recently at the Regions Beyond Gathering that's been spoken about, somebody I, I didn't know at all prayed for me and prayed and challenged me not to limit how God can use me based on what I've already done or what I feel comfortable about or what I'm good at but on scripture as the source. So another encouragement from me, for me from the body of Christ to keep pressing into the word of God and be faithful to scripture. I'm just going to finish by praying for us. Lord, won't you come and help us to fill ourselves up on your word, which contains the truth about who you are and who we are, that by your Holy Spirit enliven us, the word will move in power in our hearts and change us and transform us to be more like Jesus. Amen. Well done. I'm so glad that Gil used notes first because it gave me the freedom to as well. Hi, I'm Scott uh, and I've been given the value to speak on, on empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Miles said at the start that these values are more than just a corporate value and in fact I guess your company if you have corporate values doesn't want you just to think of them oh, as just some words. They actually want you to believe them as well. However, we really do believe these values. So I think it's important I'm going to read it out and we're going to look at the words that are used because they are actually really important. We are a church where God's presence is prized. We believe in the vitality of every member of the body being filled with the Holy Spirit and the importance of using their God-given gifts to build the church i.e. body ministry, and to impact their communities. So what does it mean to say God's presence is prized? It's a pretty particular statement, isn't it? What does it mean? So when you prize something, it means you value it extremely highly. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We want to value God's presence extremely highly. And how do we do that? How, what, how do you... How do you um, value it extremely highly. Well, you want to seek after it, right? You really want to look for it. You want to find it. You want to go after it. You don't just let it happen to you. You don't just sit back and wait for God's presence. You want to go for it, okay? That's really important part of you seeking his presence. And you want to hold, and when you find it, if, you, if it's something you prize, you want to hold on to it, right? You want to really hold on to it. You don't want to let it go. It's not something on the side, a bit of fluff. Uh, it's really important. You, it's prized. You want to hold on to it. And we want to do that in, our, in every aspect of our life. It's not just for a Sunday. Uh, it's, it's our corporate spiritual life here together on a Sunday. Absolutely. Uh, and as Kate said actually earlier about um, pressing into God's presence right, um, when she was at Marathon, right, that's something we want to do on a Sunday morning, we want to press into his presence. But it's also in our individual spiritual lives as well. We really want to seek God's presence there as well. When we're worshipping and praying and reading his word, we need to be seeking his presence in those times as well. But that's not all. It's actually every day. We need to be looking for God's presence in all that we do every day. That's part of valuing his presence highly. So it's a challenge for us all, really. I add myself into this, but I really want to actually you to really think about this as well. How do you value his presence? Do you prize it? Do you seek it daily? Do you look for it in all that you do? And I'd, I'd, really, think if, I'd really encourage you to pray about that and ask God for more of his presence in your life. The next part of the value is about uh, the vitality of every member of the body being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, as Nick, thank you Nick, also earlier on speaking about, has God spoken to him about uh, the Holy Spirit empowering us, which is what this is about. Uh, and I've also got to thank Gil for reading out my Ephesians 5.18. 
Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've ever listened to any sermons on being filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll know that where it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, doesn't just mean, here's some Holy Spirit, thank you very much, I'm filled now. It means, keep on being filled. Again, and again, and again, and again. You can't get enough It keeps on coming. Seek his presence. Seek the Holy Spirit. That's why it's vital for us to to look for that presence, to keep on being filled. Uh, And this is how we're to live our life, not by our own strength, but the continual filling of the Holy Spirit. People go through tough times. We all do. But how do you get through those times? What do you look like when you come out of those times as well? If you are living by your own strength, you will struggle more than you need to and it, than if you are seeking his Holy Spirit to empower you. And I'd encourage you to do that. That doesn't help. The next part of the... Um, Value says using their God-given gifts to build the church. Matthew 7.11 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And if I also paraphrase Romans 12.4-6, it talks about us about there being one body, that's us, Many members, that's each of you, uh, each with different gifts, that doesn't exclude anyone, that includes everyone, use them. Right? So there's no one left out of that. Everyone's included. Everyone has been gifted. Everyone has been called to use those gifts. Uh, and, he, and, if, and you're missing, we're missing you. If you've got, and you've all got gifts, and if you're not using them to build this church, we're missing you. We're missing what God's given you to add to this church. So you, you need, you're, you're depriving yourself and you're depriving the rest of us as well. Uh, how, do I, how do you know what gifts you have? If you read um, Romans 12, uh, Corinthians 12, and 1 Peter 4, it'll give you lists of practical and spiritual gifts. And if you still don't know, if none of those things ring to you, true to you, ask, ask God, ask your friends and colleagues, ask um, people in this church, ask the elders, what am I good at? What has God gifted me in? And, and they will help you understand those. Uh, don't waste your gifts. I've already spoken about that. I've jumped off my notes a bit. So the final part is to use the gifts to impact our communities. Matthew five thirteen to 16 speaks of us, each one of us, being salt of the earth and warns us about not losing our saltiness. Also speaks in the same verses, speaks of us being light of the world and warns us not to hide our light but to let it shine before others. So if you prize God's presence in, in your everyday life, that means you, you, that's your community that you work, whether it's your work or your school, wherever it is, you're to prize his presence and use it to, uh, to be that salt in that area, to, to reveal the difference that God's placed in you. So look for, for the opportunity to use both your practical and spiritual gifts to be salty and to light, shine your light before others. So quickly, because I know we're way out of time, how does this apply to me? I believe that God is my loving heavenly dad who pours out his love and his gifts all the time. He's not miserly. He doesn't give just a few. There's just not one for, for you, Nick, or one for you, Kate. He's not miserly. If you th- I don't know 
how, what your da- earthly dad's like, but your heavenly dad's not miserly. He just wants to lavish gifts upon you. He wants to give you everything. He doesn't want to give you one or two. He wants to give you ten. He wants to give them all. Is that the way that you, that you act and the, what you do? Or do you just think, oh, no, I'm just going to sit. This is my little spot here, and I'm just going to operate in there, and I'm not going to move out. I don't want to do anything else. Or are you saying to yourself, God, what's for me today? What are you going to use me to do today? What is it that I'm going to do differently today that I've never done before? Um, I know of at least of the lists, I think there's about 17 when I looked at them earlier, I've probably at times operated in, it's a funny word to use really, used, been used by God in probably about 12 gifts. Some of them I use all regularly, some of them very rarely, like standing up doing this, being able to preach. Um, but I always want to know what new, what new thing has God got me to do? What is it that I've not operated in before? Where is it that he's, he wants to show me more of his love toward me? So I look for every opportunity to use those gifts I've been given and opportunities to try gifts that I've not either had used before or not used very often. I try not to say no. If you're asked, don't say no. If, and the other one is never say never. That's a, actually probably a really, uh, as a Christian, never say, oh, no, no, that's not me. I, I, I don't do that, no. Never say never because God's got things in store for you all the time. Accept challenges when they're presented to you. You don't have to be comfortable. You weren't meant to be comfortable. Accept challenges when they're presented to you. Like preaching. Lord, thank you that you are a God that loves us so dearly, a God of lavish grace, lavish gifting, lavish. You want to just pour out your love and gifts upon every person here. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, just open people's eyes to all that you've gifted them with, that you will help them to use those gifts diligently to build your body, to encourage others, to uh, to to uh, reach out to the poor and to uh, lift them up, Lord. Everything that you've gifted them with, Lord. I pray that nothing is, uh, is left out of this church, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come upon each person here and, uh, and reveal their full gifting to them and encourage them to use it as you have gifted them. In Jesus' name, amen.